it went good. It's a very, very nice young man, very young, like 20. Came off as very, very confident and suave, and then you find out he's a virgin. <laughs> so. So how did it go with a virgin? <laughs> it was really frustrating because he was so nervous. He only paid for half an hour of full service, but he was so scared of me that he kept trying to hide under the covers and like it got all tense and it was like I was acting like he was a woman and I was raping him, like hiding from me, twisting up and tense and, and putting his legs together and covering himself and it was just so awkward. But it worked out? He's no longer a virgin? He's no longer a virgin, but he... It was impossible. Like, it was... Just, you know, he would get nervous, and then not want to, and then get all scared, and... That kept happening. And he had... He, I had to leave the room for a while and go into the bathroom and hide, because he was too nervous having me around. So I had to go sit in the bathroom and play Sudoku for like five minutes. Was it your first time with a virgin? That's... That I'm aware of. First time with virgin that I'm aware of. Uh, when I worked in a massage parlor, a lot of guys say they're virgins to try and get a deal. So you never ever believe a guy in this industry when he says he's a virgin right off the bat because they think they'll give, you'll give them a discounted rate or something. But this guy, on the other hand, tried lying and saying he wasn't one. And then afterwards, when he was getting all nervous, I asked him if he was okay, and that's when he confessed after paying that indeed he was, so I believe him. Massage is like their dirty old man. For some reason, older white men have like these tiny little nubbins that are like this big. I kid you not. Like there's that one Lauren, or let's say this one guy, L, who has an inverted penis. It's like, like a little a tortoise, right? And then you give it a fight. <laughs> <Pops laughs> the shelf. Pops into the shelf. You have to push on either side of it for it to like pop out. It's the weirdest thing. He can't even hand He can't even have sex. It's so tiny. He like tries to rub his, himself against you and get off that way. And I don't know. I he feel sorry for him. Yeah, he does. Good for him. It's like that Asian guy I had that was a virgin that I told you about. That yeah, mm -hmm. uh, he was so small. He came in, it was 18th birthday. This is when I first got into massage. And uh, he wanted to lose his virginity, but he was so small, I couldn't even fit a condom on there. I couldn't even fit a finger cut if I tried. <laughs> so I got on top, and then I held the condom on, like, behind me. And I was jumping up down, making noises, and giving him, like, a finger job. And he finished in the condom, like, with my fingers. And he thought it, it was me. He thought he got it in. I must have one really tight one if <laughs> he did, but, yeah. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's huge guys that you can't even really accommodate, if you Tell will. Oh, about the East Indian yeah, guy. Yeah, I had this East Indian guy that came in. He was young. He was in his early 20s. And uh, also when I first started, and he had come to the parlor a few times before, and the girls laughed because he comes to see the new girls. And uh, I went and I took him in, and in the massage parlor, like, there's a room, and there's a bed, and, and then the shower and stuff. So you bring them in. They have their shower, and then they uh, lie on the table while they wait for you, and then you start it off with a massage and everything, right? So I started doing the massage and talking to him, and everything was fine. And then he turned over, and I got a glance at it, and it was like an anaconda, <laughs> was to put it politely, and I was like, and as I'm giving massage and talking to him, I'm trying to be polite and not say anything about it. It's like getting bigger and bigger, and it's like, he was so big that when he got hard, it wasn't full hard, it was like, still hard, it was hard, but it was like semi-hard. It was just massive, and I told him, like, I'm sorry, there's no way, I, I can't give you a blood drop because I can't put on a condom. And uh, I can't do any services with you because there's no way I would even fit that in me. Like, there's no, I can't do it. And he said to me, no, it's okay, he's come there a few times before, and he's still a virgin, and you can't get a girlfriend. Because of the fact that he's so big. Um, so well, how I ended big up. was it? Like, show us your hands. God, I'm not joking. It was like that long and probably like that thick. So he came a few times before and he ends up getting a hand job and going, that's pretty much all he can get. And it's like a two hand hand job because it's so goddamn massive. And I thought to myself, you know, we laugh, but the guys with the little dicks that always come in there and you gotta say, you gotta make them feel good and be like, oh, you're so big. And you want to laugh, but you kind of look at this kind and of feel sorry for it. Yeah. 
Like those guys with the little ones, they're always like, tell me how big it is, you like that big cock, and you're like, yes, oh, it's massive arm, you know. <laughs> He was a very, very nice guy. Um, actually, he was very concerned about my safety in this industry and was asking me to make sure I take precautions from now on. So that was very nice of him. Really? And it was genuine? You really felt? Yeah, yeah it was genuine. He was asking me all sorts of questions. This was after the session. And uh, he did not want to pony up the cash. No, he just thought that it was a lot of money. Which it really is. I mean, once you consider add the drop into it for basic service, which is all he paid for, for half an hour still, he's paying $500. Because it's illegal in Canada to say a sexual service in exchange for money, it's considered solicitation. What we do to explain it to clients is when we say basic service, instead of saying what that means, we do this. Okay. <laughs> Straight up hand motions. All the, all the way. Police can't pin anything on you if you do hand motions. So basic service is one of these and half services, you point to this or you do this. I just say full service is the full meal deal and then kind of like do that. I see. And then if they want me to explain Greek, which is anal, I just point back and say back door. <laughs> okay. How often do they ask for anal? Not often at all, which very much surprises me. You'd think that would be a service guys would call an escort for, but not so much. When I worked in a massage parlor, like a rub and tug, they came in much more often inquiring about Greek, whereas now I get very little unless I throw it out on the table as an offer. Guys don't even seem to realize that I do do that. We have this doctor, it's as long as I've been in the industry, that comes to the salons and uh, he's banned from a few of them. And what this guy likes to do is he likes to eat other clients' cum. Now, um, he's come in a few times and asked if he can like, give other clients blowjobs and that, but mostly when he's coming to a new studio, he asks the girls if they have any used condoms with cum in them, because we usually keep them to throw out. And um, you got to take the condom and just like squeeze it out into his mouth and he'll eat it. He'll pay an extra $200, $200, but that's his fetish. He likes to eat cum. Why does a person in the medical profession think that that's safe? He thinks to think that as soon as semen's uh, in the air, like everyone, that anything that's disease, diseased in the semen is going to die, which I'm pretty sure it doesn't work like that. But uh, I don't know, or maybe it could be for him the taboo where he, he's risking, like the, the feeling you get when you take big chances or big risks, that he, maybe he might get something, but he just doesn't. I'm not sure, but it's kind of gross and he comes in all the time and doesn't. I've, I've had him once and... Um, it's probably one of the most difficult sessions you can have because the smell, first of all, and just the consistency of, of taking it out and putting it in someone else's mouth, I don't know. It was good and bad at the same time. It was good in that uh, he paid for an hour and a half and I made $1,500, but he was really annoying. <laughs> He'd obviously been drinking, he didn't understand, and he wasn't trying to be rough, but he just didn't understand the boundary of how hard you push on somebody or hold your hand on somebody. He slapped my ass so hard that he left four distinct fingerprints on it. Okay. How old would you say he was? Early to mid-twenties, actually. It's funny. Because when he, the first time when we were finished and he ran down to the ATM, because after we were finished, the second time he tried running down again but couldn't bring out as much money, the first time he actually brought me his bank statement so that he could prove to me he's got money from the ATM. And sure enough, I don't know if you could see that, but he has $205,000 in his bank. Wow, that's quite a sum for a mid-twenties. Yeah, native guy from the reserve. He said he works oil field, but he also said he likes to sleep until 3 p.m. every day, so I don't know what kind of work he does. Well, how come he didn't want to do more time, or it just... He wanted to do more time, but 
regardless of how much money you have in your bank account, most bet banks set limits to how much you can withdraw in a day, and he just reached the limit. He was able to withdraw 400 more and was asking me to stay for 15 minutes. And I would have, but then he lit up a cigarette, and it was just like the money wasn't worth at this point in time being around the cigarette smoke for me. Was he an in-shape guy? No, and he was very insecure about his body. He made that very clear. He pretty much for the first uh, 15 minutes I was in there held the blanket around him as he walked around, and he wore a shirt the entire time I was there. He didn't take it off once. Sometimes it can be where I'm in a total rage and all that I see is that rage and like the whole core of me disappears and I just become that raging horrible person. I would love to see PJ dead. I'd love to torture him, have him in a basement, go down there every few hours and just punch and punch his face till it's a bleeding pulp, take baseball bats to his bones, knives, cut him up. I'm 41 and I have no family, I'm not married, and I really feel like huh, it's a huge part of why I don't have any of that, because I've let these emotions in these little tunnels, if you will, completely take over my existence, and it's ruined a lot of my friendships, my relationships, I've just done terrible things. I, I mean, I hate how my life has turned out, really, I, I do. I. Sometimes I wake up and I can't understand what happened in my life. He was smoking crack the entire time I was in the room with him. And wasn't that like a luxury hotel and he was smoking crack in there? It seemed... Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful hotel inside and outside. It seems like a nicer place, definitely. He was smoking crack. <laughs> out of like a glass pipe. No, out of this little cigarette, cigar looking thing. And he just shoved the crack rocks in it. And I've never seen crack before, so it was a whole new learning experience for me. Did he offer you some? Yes. Not that you would the do. moment I walked in, he like put this little crack pipe in my face and was like, Do you want some? <laughs> Didn't even realize what it was. I was just like, No, it looked like a cigar. <laughs> but. Did he tell you anything about his life or why he was smoking crack? Just... He did not mention the crack one bit, not at all. Um, he had a kerfuffle trying to get his credit card to work and went downstairs to get cash out and on one of those times I phoned Milan and she mentioned that every time he comes to the city he calls and he's always smoking crack. And the whole hotel knows him as, you know, Tom the Crackhead and all the girls in the industry know him as Tom the Crackhead. Did he look like a crackhead, stereotypical? You know, to be honest, I would say yes. But also, a lot I find, I find a lot of older people in this area kind of look like a stereotypical crackhead just because it's a labor area, it's a lot of hardworking people that get really weather beaten. And so, I didn't realize it at first, I thought he was just an older guy that had worked hard his whole life and <laughs> was smoking cigars until I looked at that and realized it was crack. <laughs> Did he have much of a sexual drive when he was cracked out? I don't know. He didn't pay for full service. Like, he basically just got me to, like, sit there naked and chat with him and touch myself, and then he tried touching himself, but it didn't look like anything was going on, so... He was watching porn the whole time, so I'm sure he has the desire. I just don't think the body is capable. I'm an alcoholic. My parents were alcoholics. My grandparents... I obviously have the predisposition to be an alcoholic. Alcohol's really screwed up my life in many ways. In my early 20s, I got into copious trouble, DUI, disorderly conduct, a bunch of misdemeanors, you know, just being drunk and stupid. Alcohol lets me escape. It is a release, so will I ever quit? I don't know. Sometimes I'll go a year without drinking, but my anxiety gets so high when I'm not drinking. The drinking does take that anxiety away, but then I get in trouble, so it's, you know, that double-edged sword. Young guy, um, quite good looking. He was just very, very broke. He gave me the drop fee, which is 190, and he gave me 200 because nobody ever has 190 and um, basically only had 20 other dollars left. 
Was he upset that he really didn't get any service for... He was not upset in the least. He was very understanding. He didn't even ask for the drop fee back. I wanted to offer because I felt very bad. He's staying at this crappy hotel because he's homeless right now. He does have a job though. So I guess the situation could be a lot worse, but uh, he told me not to worry about it, just take the fee. He totally understands and he wants to call me again when he gets paid. Was that hotel, what's it like? The guy has to take you upstairs? It's Yeah, the doors are all locked. He had to pay the guy at the front desk like $22 or something to have a guest come up after 11 p.m. Wow. So I had to even show my ID to the front desk guy and register that I came in after 11 p.m. I went up to that room. The hotel itself is actually really amazing. It's run down, but in a way that just gives it so much character. Like, it was beautiful. The room was, it was awful, but beautiful at the same time. I loved it. I remember how we came up with the idea, okay? We had always joked about making like a fake poop and leaving it by the door or something because the girls would freak out. And this girl Diana princesses. Had, and this girl Diana had run out to go get food for herself. And it was so slow that day, just agonizingly slow. Paisley was like, oh well, let's make some fake poop and started just mixing the random things we together. Had uncovered yeah, there cereal was a, and all this shit. There was a, like a little kitchenette in Jaylee's so that we could cook. We had two little mini fridges, we had our own little kitchenette. And like a back area because you're there for eight hours a day. So she started mixing together all this stuff, made a little fake poop, and we put together this practical joke where we made it look like uh, when Diana came back that uh, Paisley got violently ill and pooped herself <laughs> trying to run out to the back. We screeched it into this bag and then I had it between my legs. So she was sitting on the couch with Diana and then I was behind the um Behind the lockers. Behind the lockers, right, and then she had to say, are you okay? And then I'd be like, oh, I'm not feeling good. <laughs> and then I was supposed to run out, be like, oh, and then squeeze it to my legs. And uh, the camera angle that we got from from the studio thing, you can see like little blobs of shit, right? <laughs> little blobs of shit. And then she taped the two from her side, the reaction, Dinah's reaction. So I ran out, did that, and I went all the way down the hallway. There's just this little blobs of shit, like a dog that poos itself. <laughs> but you can hear me laughing like, oh. It looked like you were in pain though. You couldn't pick up on the laugh. It looked like you were crying and in pain. And the look on Diana's face. She I was mortified, but she, she wanted to laugh, but she she didn't want to offend me, so but but it, was, yeah. it was amazing. It was such a slow night. What else were we going to do? We just had to poop ourselves. <laughs> he was a little weird. Weird how? Well, uh, he works with disabled people for a living, like mentally handicapped children and adults. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was a little mentally handicapped, just the way he acted. Maybe it's from being around those people. Is that wrong to say, those people? No, it's not. <laughs> well, either way, maybe it's from dealing with people like that for an extended period of time that it's just his mannerisms have changed, but that's what I thought. What did he want sexually? Like... Oh, he just wanted basic full service. I see, okay. Yeah. Was he... Age-wise, what, how old? Uh, it's really hard to say because of the way he acted, but I'd peg him around 50. What, in good shape, physically, or kind of? Oh, yeah. Pretty good shape. Anything else strike you about that call? His walls were purple. Really? Yeah. That's flamboyant. Yeah, he complained about that. Apparently he hasn't been living here long. But, uh, yeah, he, um kept saying how it was too bad that I'm an escort because I'm a very nice, bright young lady and I could be doing anything with my life. I could have a doctorate if I wanted and it's just too bad that I'm doing this. And it's also too bad because now I can't give him my number because he would like to be friends with me or maybe my husband. I just fucked with him there and told him I already had a husband. How did he respond? Not well. I thought it was funny. You think he was jealous or just weird? Or... Uh, he seemed weirded out by the concept that I wouldn't be single. And uh, a little jealous, actually, yeah. Have you, either of you had orgasms during a paid gig? No, I, I have. Haven't. You have? Yeah, I have. It depends, especially with how long I was single for. And I mean, I gotta say, you get some pretty good looking clients in sometimes at the massage parlor there. I went on a date, dates with a couple of them. So, yeah, no, those, 
It's fine. Uh, I, I can get up with domination. That's not hard for me. There you go. Yeah, I, sexual you stuff like enough. beating men. I like yeah. Well, how do you get off? So when you're beating somebody, you just have an orgasm? It's just that? I don't know how to explain it, but I can get off on having the, the control of the power of someone and knowing what I'm doing to them and that they're basically my bitch. Meow like cat. You know. Meow, meow, meow. Meow, 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 meow. Go, go, go. Hurry, hurry. What are you doing? Put your head face the floor. Face the floor. Keep your face on the floor and you're going to walk in the room with me. Head onto the bed, face down. That can produce that can, an orgasm. That can produce an orgasm because it's for me, it's mental, right? Even it's if there's no physical. stimulation physically on your organ. It doesn't have to be. For the first time in my life, I understood and knew real hate. When I would get into an argument or a fight with someone, I would just go for the juggler instantly. I would say the worst things to destroy them. It's like a, another person took over my body after that breakup and I could say to someone in an email, I hope you die. I never had that hate growing up. I was a curious, good kid and now, when I'm angry, I hate till the ends of the earth, and I hate that. It's as if, you know, there are no boundaries for me, and that young, curious, innocent person died 10 years ago with that breakup. He just got eviscerated, and here I am, full of intense hate. I guess he watches a lot of porn and thought I was lying to him when I said it was too big. Like, way too big. I don't know if he just didn't care that I was in pain or if he honestly thought I was lying about that because he accused me of lying about it multiple times. And it's like, no. <laughs> if I'm going to lie about something, I'm going to tell you I'm enjoying it, not that I'm hating every second of it and I'm in pain. No, it was just like I couldn't do it. So he lasted a long time just because I had to keep, like, stopping and sitting there in pain. No amount of money's worth that. That made me want to quit my job that day. So how did it end? Was he upset? No, he tried to stick it in a different hole and I shoved him off and screamed at him and then he was like, oh, I'm sorry, and then he finished like with me yelling at him in his hand. Really? And just yeah. went there? I yeah. I don't know how, I guess he likes women yelling at him. I don't know. Did you tell your agent that you were sore from that guy or anything like this? Yeah, I told her after I called, because they always ask you how the call went, and I told her straight up, I'm like, if they ever call again, I cannot go. If a guy named Phil from St. Albert calls and says he's seen me before, I will not see him. Ever. Could he even talk? Was he that old or he could make sense and everything? He was... Yeah, he could talk fine. Uh, he needed a hearing aid to really understand me. And once he put his teeth in, he talked much better. But what did he want from you? Just companionship? To talk? I don't actually know. I mean, he didn't have a lot of money, so I just kind of stayed to chat with him. Like, I just sat with him naked and chatted. And he asked me quest the same questions repeatedly. Was he sad to see you go or no? He looked very sad and... <laughs> He stopped talking a lot when I had to put my clothes back on and leave, so yeah, I don't think he was happy. Disgusting old man. He hadn't had sex in years, and he still hasn't. He thinks he did, but his penis would not work. Little does he know, he came in my hand and not anywhere else, and he can continue to believe that. So you were in a semi-truck? Yes, that? it's a semi-truck, you know, like a log hauling truck. What was the inside of the truck like? Can you just describe what? Okay, to be honest, it's probably the nicest semi I've ever seen. I've only ever been in the older ones as a child, and this is much nicer than I remember. Like, it's shaped kind of like the front reminds you of a motorhome, you know, really nice armrests on the chairs, really comfy chairs. I actually took a picture of the navigation stuff. It looks like a navigation system of an airplane running those things. It was crazy. I had to take a picture because there's so many dials. Yeah, it's like two seats and then this tiny little bed directly behind the seat. It's like right there. Was that the first time you were in one of those? 
Uh, for a call, yes. And did it end well, or how did the call end? Well, he ended it prematurely, obviously, and then I left, and obviously there's no washrooms in these trucks, so I went inside the, there's a restaurant right here, to use the washroom and wash myself, and on the way out of the ladies' room, he was standing in the lobby of the restaurant and accused me of stealing his wallet, which I'm still not happy about. He had his wallet in there, I remember seeing it. I don't even know where I would have had time to steal it. I mean, it's like being in the cab of this truck and me taking your wallet without you noticing. It's ridiculous. My first sexual experience was in the back seat of a car. Jenny was driving the car. I was in the back with Gina. She touched me. I had an orgasm, but I'd never had one before, so I didn't know what it was. Obviously, I knew I'd heard about coming and having orgasms, but I didn't know. I just knew that there was this huge euphoric sensation that overcame my body. When I was at home later, I felt all of the wetness and I thought I actually peed until it dawned on me that that was an orgasm. Older guy. Um, Older, 60s, late 50s? Yeah, 60s. Somewhere in there. Like, really nice, really polite, didn't ask me to do anything I wasn't comfortable with, was very okay with everything I said. Um, his penis wouldn't work, so he paid me $600 for nothing. Like... Do you think he paid you because he was embarrassed, or he just knew... No, they pay ahead of time, right? Okay. So he thought his penis would work, and I kept asking him, he's like, I don't know, usually it works. But, um, uh, yeah. Easy, I guess. It's stressful for me when that happens too, though. I always get worried at the end that they're gonna get angry and try requesting money back, <laughs> but they usually don't. When that's happened before, what have you said? No, no. We had... <laughs> yeah. I just say, no, there's no refunds. I was still here that time. Did he want you to watch him jerking off? Was that yes. part of his thrill? He wanted me to talk to him. Talk dirty or just tell him stories? Just say his name over and over and over. He wanted me to lay there and, oh, look, a siren. Say his name over and over and over. Was he a middle-aged man or how old would you say? Older. Definitely okay. past middle age. Do you think he was married to or do you know? If... He struck me more as the kind of guy that would be married. Uh, he's not from here, just in for the weekend and for business, so... I don't know, usually with those types it seems like they are. I'm not a good lover. I don't have stamina. I do at times, like, for instance, if I drink, I'll have stamina. But sometimes it just feels so good that I can't hold back and, you know? And I'm also not gifted in the size department. So the one thing I have, I always try to satisfy the woman. So, you know, at least I'm trying and I'm honest with my shortcomings. He's like the typical dirty old man. He really wanted anal. Okay. Which I do offer, but he didn't pay for it. And so he kept trying to stick his fingers in holes that his fingers didn't belong in. I didn't like that. And so what would happen when that would occur? I kept telling him no. And he's obviously the kind of guy, and there is a particular kind of man who frequents massage parlors and escorts. He's definitely one of those. And when you work in this industry, you can tell they're just the typical dirty old man. They know exactly what all the terms mean. They know what they want. They try to get out of paying uh, right away. And they also push and push your boundaries because a lot of girls, if guys keep pushing, will just give in. Personally, growing up, I always looked at prostitutes as you know, good for them. Wow, they're really smart. Charging money for sex, that's great. Are you always on positive hours? And yeah. Like, Ew, dirty hooker. Uh -huh. Really? Yeah, I was always <laughs> disgusted by it. I'm like, who the fuck are you selling your pussy? You're just disgusting. But I never understood. I looked at the way the society looks at it, like they're dirty, drug addicted, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. The only way I changed my mind is um, when I got into it, and I think I told you, I tried to, I got hired to rub and tug in 2000 and... Six, what is a rub and tug? A massage parlor. Yeah. It's just the obvious term, rub and tug. <laughs> you get a rub and then a tug. So what did you think growing up? You thought prostitutes were dirty people who were doing immoral things. Is that because of your 
background yeah, religiously? Yeah, I grew up Catholic, so I kind of grew up with the idea that it was wrong, it was immoral, and that, that um, it was just dirty, right? And then, like I said, I looked at the way uh, most of society looks at it, that girls that did it were drug addicted and, and just full of diseases and stuff. But you found that not to be the case. There are people such as you two who don't drink, who don't do drugs, who yeah. do it because of financial uh, areas you got into, you needed financial help or whatever, so there's... Or because I'm lazy. Define lazy. I don't like to work. My parents have always made the jokes that I'm allergic to work. He booked me for two hours at $900 an hour. It's quite a lot of money. What was the call like? It was interesting. He was, um... Definitely very shy at first and came off as very non-talkative at all and uh, Then he warmed up a little bit and He was very nerdy. He had a glass case in his bedroom with like rare comic books on display in it and uh, He wanted to kind of cuddle a lot Which I thought was really odd just because of the way he did it He like just grabbed me and forcibly made me cuddle with him whereas most guys ask and then he asked me to pee on him. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. So I did. And he liked it, obviously. He loved it. He wanted to film it, which we don't allow us, ourselves to be filmed, so didn't do that. But I've never done that before. So I thought that was quite interesting. How did the call end? W with that. Okay. <laughs> Actually, because I always go pee before hand and he hadn't asked me or said anything about wanting to do that so I had to drink like a ton of water near the end of the call because then he came up with me would you be willing to do this? How old would you say he was? Oh um he was only eight years older than me so he's 30. Definitely had a nerdy kind of look to him like just the facial features were a little softer and kind of curly reddish blonde hair and sideburns looked really out of place. What do you think he did for a living? Do you... Oh, um, he wasn't, he had his welder certi certificate, but I asked, and he wasn't a welder, he was an inspector. The guy said he's gonna kill me. <laughs> what he did to my car and the way everything happened, like I said to you, it was like a movie, right? But the cops didn't even believe me how it happened. Um, the Edmonton police really said scared. that they were going to arrest you for trying to hit the guy with a car. Or they threatened you. I mean, yeah, why even though this guy attacked me with a bat, told me he was going to bash my head, and probably would have jabbed me back and me rape me because this, the way these guys were acting and they were high on crap too. They had the intentions that something was going to happen, right? A lot of the guys that come out of town think we're old, old hookers or like street hookers, and they can do whatever they want and nobody's going to care, right? The cops said because even though I was fleeing for my life when I went over the embankment and I accidentally hit the guy because he was standing in the way of my car, they were going to charge me for using force of the deadly weapon for hitting him if I tried to lay charges against him for trying to kill me. Because of the stigma on prostitutes, yeah. escorts? Yeah, they thought I was there doing something illegal when it wasn't. We're licensed to do this job. I was there for a licensed call, but they don't care, right? The cops just didn't care. That Why cop, do you think that is? Because there's such a stigma attached to prostitutes? Yeah, and they're not educated, right? I mean, I'm sure a lot of the, the girls that they deal with are, like, are street girls that are drug addicted or full of drama and do crazy things. And a lot of girls in this industry are attached to the drugs and alcohol with clients and stuff. So, it, And it wasn't the greatest era either. It probably did look suspicious. I was in one relationship and it was so stable, this woman was so kind and she had no ups and downs that I ended up destroying the relationship. I could not handle that there was no drama, there was no fighting and it was so foreign to me that you could actually live life and be like that. I remember going to her family's house in Brooklyn for dinner and it totally overwhelmed me that people could be this nice and this kind and treat people that way. I ended up, I feel bad, I destroyed the relationship and it was me, I just melted down. I could not take the normality, the stableness, the kindness. It seems like it's just part of it, you know, hookers and blow. Some guys can't get erections with coke, but I guess others can. It does impact it immensely. I seem to be able to, like, make it work every every time, 
but it does impact the time they need immensely. Like, if a guy has been doing that and he only buys half an hour, it's not going to be enough. It's just not. In fact, almost every time I go to a hotel room, there's cocaine on the table or counter or something. In a bag or laid out No, like laid out, ready to be cut into lines and just a little pile. Sometimes it's already in lines, just laying there. Or sometimes just residue. And then they offer, like, I have more, you know, do you want to No, lie? they're always just like, and it's kind of like a passing thing, like, they want to offer it to be polite, sort of. It's like, oh, well, do you want some of this? <laughs> they were so high, so out of it, it took them forever to come down and get us. I was worried it was a prank because they just weren't coming down. You, were they high on coke or marijuana? No, just marijuana. <laughs> like, oh. so out of it. The one guy was... More, more had his wits about him than the guy that came to get us. The guy that came to get us dropped his phone, couldn't figure out how to open his own door to get back in, and kept mumbling. We couldn't understand a word he was saying, and he kept saying shit over and over that didn't make any sense. And um, then when we got up to the room, the place was a complete mess. Like It looks like people are either just moving out or just moving in. It's totally disheveled. There's just like paper and random stuff everywhere. There's no couches, no TV. At the salons, did you see a higher rate of addiction like alcohol and drugs with yeah. the girls? Yeah, because of the clientele that came in, a lot of the, the clientele were into that and um, they had bus trades for the girls. So they'd say, okay, well, I'll pay you $160, but if you don't use the condom, I'll give you, you know, how many grams of crack or coke or whatever. And Sarah and I know a couple girls like that that we've worked with. Was he a kinky guy or why do you want two girls? Did he he was really drunk and probably had done some drugs and was just really out of it and wanted to party, I guess. Was it weird being with another girl and just one guy? Was it awkward? Hello. 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 That's okay. Yep, yep, I'm in the car. Um. It was quite something. He was very, very out of it, <laughs> but he was nice. <laughs> he got off in the last, like, ten minutes, which was amazing. She got him off, but he, is, he wasn't hard, and I was, like, touching myself in the corner because I didn't know what to do, right? You know, it's kind of only room for one girl there. Girls get into this for different reasons. It's not all because we're single moms or because we all have drug habits. Everyone's got their reason, and it's a very addictive job. It's really hard to get out of. Um, I've tried getting out of it, and because it's hard. Because of the money? The money, it's hard, right? This is a lot of, for me, It's the money is a big part of it, but it, it's also, you can go on a call, be with a client, and they can tell you things that your own boyfriend can't even tell you at home, right? They can treat you in ways that you, you're a man, or your people at home don't listen to you or treat you. And it's the same thing with the clients. They're not getting whatever they want at home. That's what they're, they're calling us. And it is, for the most part, it's um, artificial, but it makes you feel better. So it's a mental thing, too. I mean, there's a lot of things that affect you mentally that will turn you off it, like getting assaulted or girls getting busted or dealing with people that are drug addicted and high in it all the time. But the addiction, it's not something that's just, you can just quit cold turkey, right, if you've been in for a long time. They're roofers, all of them. They all live and work here. And the one guy, I guess they all went to the casino tonight, he won almost eight grand after putting down like three dollars, I think it was either a slot machine or blackjack, I can't remember actually. And yeah, won eight grand off three dollars. And so did he pay for both escorts? Uh, he paid the drop fee, he also paid for the suite. And in this hotel, if you get one of the corner suites, it costs, after taxes, it's a thousand dollars a night. How was it working with Alexis? It was good. I've seen her twice before now. She seems to be warming up. Like, she wasn't very talkative the first time, but now she's quite nice. Did she strip in front of you, or is it a different room? It wasn't a different room. Uh, these suites are, like, they have their one big main bed because they're themed. And this suite was the ice theme, so the big main bed was an igloo. They had, like, dog sleds in the corner and everything was all polar themed. And then they've got these two bunk beds on the side. Okay. So I was in one of the bunk beds and it has like a draw curtain and she had the guy who won the money on the main bed.
Was it? Could you hear her moaning? Oh, no, you could see everything through the curtain, to our way through, because the light was on on the other side. So we could see them playing to the day. They just couldn't see us. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Did it look like she was enjoying it, or not really? No. Um, unfortunately, because the guys had won a bunch of money and were blowing it all, they also bought a bunch of cocaine, and had done that, and so that definitely impacted their ability to perform. Was there coke in the room? Not that we saw, but they did ask if we did some, so I'm sure they had it somewhere. My life's been a total failure. You said you preferred a hotel to a motel. Can you describe that? Why? It's safer. Um, pretty much the most dangerous places to go to, it seems like, with motels. It just seems like when guys want to kill somebody or hurt somebody, they go to a motel and then get the girl to come over. I don't know. I guess it's just the thing to do. Well, is it easier access since the door's on the outside? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure when you get a room at a motel like this, you don't need to give the identification that you need to at a hotel. I don't know if they even require a credit card to rent a room. Apparently, they pay attention to who's coming in and out of their hotel here. The security guard actually came up and tried to see what I was doing up there because they knew that I didn't have a room key, so he followed me up to the fifth floor and he was talking to me. And we were just talking in a quiet, hushed tones because we are in the hallway. And uh, then the lady next door, an old woman, pokes her head out of the door and comes out into the hallway yelling at us, Do you know what time it is? Blah, 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 blah. And I just looked at her with a smile on my face because I couldn't help it. So she looked at me and said, You are an ugly bitch! And closed the door and went back in her room. Wow, like a hotel you can't be walking around at 5 a.m. No, me a apparently break. not. And standing with the security guard of the hotel, and she says that. I actually ended up, in the time that I was waiting for him, I had enough time to write out some really nasty notes to her, but I didn't put them under her door like I planned on doing. <laughs> Just left. <laughs> it's for a number of different reasons. Sometimes it's a prank call and the guy doesn't even live there, but this is honestly like I think they just passed out. So even with pounding on the door, they just don't wake up, yeah. Yeah, and the problem with a hotel like this is you can't just pound on the door. You, especially at this hour, you don't want to cause a disturbance because uh, most hotels don't like escorts, most hotel staff, and they'll find any reason to kick you out if they think you're an escort, so you don't want to get banned from a hotel. <laughs> when you go into a nice hotel like the Hilton, do they look at you or you just walk past them or how? I just walk past them. A lot of times if I am worried, if I haven't been to the hotel before and it is nicer, I'll call somebody and talk on the phone because they're not going to harass you when you're talking on the phone. So you um, walk by them on the phone and they just... Yeah, just talk to somebody on the phone for the couple minutes it takes to get to the elevator. But they watch you. Was this really nice guy, John, um, in Las Vegas, and you know, he was always sending nice messages. And then he just told me yesterday that he's... Uh, He's dying. And the. F just it. He was nice enough, you know, the whole time he's known uh, that he's been dying to, like, reach out to me and always tell me to. <laughs> have, like, a good day and stuff. Just the fact that he would take his time. Shows you truly amazing people are out there. I am not a racist person. I like to say I'm culturist. There are certain cultures I do not agree with, the ones who look down upon women. And especially being in Canada, it's a very multicultural country, you get those here. And they come in to the studios and treat you the way that they treat their women back home. 
and we call them turbinators, <laughs> the East Indian, the Sikhs, or um, you know, those areas of the world people that come in with their big turbans on and everything, they don't shower and even no matter how many times you ask them to shower they will not wash themselves. They expect to be able to push you around physically. Like they will pay for you and if they do agree to your price, which is very rare because they like to barter you and try to get you for like a hundred dollars, which when you're paying a sixty dollar room fee would be like forty bucks. Or they're, they're big on not using condoms and trying to pull them off during sessions. Yes, yeah, so they too. will try to pull them off or rip them and try to just stick it in. But they'll try to stick it in other holes and when you argue with them and say don't do that, they freak out and say this is what I paid for, this is what I paid for. And, no, it isn't. You paid for that one. You're putting it in the wrong one. But uh, they, they'll they be rough with you physically too. Like They'll grab you and just kind of push you in this position and grab you and push you in another one. And I think it's probably worse that they've paid for you too, because they think, oh, I've paid for this. Like now. property. It's, just, it's a commodity. Yeah. And you can't help seeing that over and over to become prejudiced against these people now. And I don't like the fact that I am, but when you have those experiences, what can you do about it? What happened? Um, nice enough guy. Definitely had money, but just wasn't willing to spend the amount it would have taken in total to get me to do the services he wanted. What did he want? Full service? Yeah, he just wanted full service, and after he paid the drop, he only had $200 more in cash, and he was willing to pay like $100 more with credit card. But basically, his way of negotiating was just saying that he wanted full service and he was not willing to pay more than $300 for it. And I just told him it's not not worth it for me. It's not feasible. How do you feel when a call busts like that? Are you upset? or? Um, it depends. Uh, normally, I'm not too upset because normally with a bus call, it's bust and you're out within at least 20 minutes of negotiation. But I feel like I was in there for a lot longer because I really thought there was potential to get money out of him, so I do feel like I really wasted my time, and I am quite disappointed in that. And you mentioned a dog. Yeah, he had a really cute dog, and that's probably another reason why I spent so much time in there, because half the time was just, like, getting the dog to stop jumping on me. It was a young black lab. So I'm coated in dog slobber right now. How long do you guys think you'll be in this industry? That's I've a loaded been, question. <laughs> I've been trying to get out of it. I've been in it for four years on and off, and I try to get out of it, but honestly, it's so addictive, it's hard to get out because of the money and the time it gives you, right? And the lifestyle, um, I think I've talked before that part of it's that addictive is, it's not just the money, but you know, you don't know who's going to be on the side of the door. It's kind of exciting in a way, some parts of it. So I'm trying to be out of it, hopefully within the next year, because mentally, it's affected me in a way that I can't carry on and I have a daughter that's getting older and I don't want my daughter being influenced by it. Why mentally can't you carry on? Because of assaults and baggage and stuff? or That, I mean, you, you know, when you, and you can probably relate to this, a lot of times when clients talk to you, it's not always sexual, they have problems and they talk to you about, you take on other people's problems and then it's a drama in the industry and then it's, there's no consistency with the money. I used to make 20 grand a month. I'm down to four grand a month now, right? And I'm only seeing four clients compared to seeing like 20 clients is a difference. Um, but it's just the way the industry's gone and I need consistency to be able to pay my bills. For me, it's a completely different monster. Like, I have nothing, I don't have the mental baggage yet. Obviously, it's only been a couple of years for me, but uh, personally, I would ideally like to do this job until I'm about 30, which would give me about eight more years and have enough money saved up to just go into property, like just buying property, different parts of the world where it's booming, anything like that where I can just buy and sell property. I'm not really interested in flipping houses. I'm not interested in work like that. I just want to buy property, sit on it, and sell when the market's good. That's what I would ideally like to do for the remainder of my life. A request was pantyhose, uh, high heels, and a dress. So I think he just wanted a girl that was nicely dressed, not in jeans and a t-shirt. When you showed up without the pantyhose, was he upset or...? Oh no, I immediately brought it up and apologized so that he wouldn't think anything or point it out, right? So I let him know that I did get the request, I just didn't have any and I'm sorry about that and he didn't care at all. It was pretty much like we negotiated very quick, it was in and out straight to business and out of there, not a lot of talking. What did he want? 
Like, um, I'm sure he wanted more than he could afford. Once he heard the prices, he just agreed to like the basic minimum service. And um, I'm sure he wanted more than that. He seemed a little disappointed, but he was happy nonetheless. What age would you say he was approximately? Late 50s, early 60s maybe, but probably late 50s. Did you see a ring, like marriage? I didn't notice. I have no idea, but I doubt it because he said it had been a, a year and a half since he'd done any sexual contact with a woman. Did he sound like he had a good time? Oh yeah, he thoroughly enjoyed it and thanked me many, many times. <laughs> So this was a morning call? Yes, we got the call at 10 to 7. Do you prefer morning or evening? I much prefer the really like early in the night calls, you know, early shift calls at about 10 p.m. Because then if you only get those in a night, you're home by midnight and you can sleep the whole night through. Do you think that man that you were just with was married or do you did you see a ring or...? Um, I didn't see, and to be honest, I didn't really get enough of his personality. He didn't say anything about his personal life, so I really would have no idea. So it was just very business-like? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, yeah. And he had showered, he was up for the morning, so he smelled like cologne instead of like old sweat. So that was nice. So he's probably going off to work or something, or traveling? Definitely traveling. He, the, all I found out is that he's flying out of Edmonton today. Today was the only day he was in Edmonton, so probably some sort of convention or something. Was the guy married that you met that night for the call, or what was he like? Uh, yes. I, he didn't say so, but he had, um, he sneakily took off the wedding ring he had halfway in through. In front of you? Like, no, not in front of me, but I noticed he had it when I walked in, and then when I was leaving, I noticed he wasn't wearing it, and it was sitting on the dresser. He was a very funny guy. Yeah, he was very funny. He was very into having an actual conversation with me. Um, what did he do? Pleasant. Do you know, like, work-wise? He must have made a lot of money because he's one of those people that works for a very big company and gets sent all over North America and all over the world for about five days at a time to oversee something and go into meetings and then he's off to somewhere else. Uh, he lived in Minnesota, but his ideal place to live, if he could choose, would be Fargo, North Dakota, because he says it's a lovely town. I wonder if a lot of those men who travel like that hide from their wives that they're with escorts. Obviously, he was with you. I'm sure he hides that from his wife. I mean, I'm not positive, but the odds are likely that uh, he hides that from his wife, yes. <laughs> And neither of those guys were really crazy, kinky, the smoke-filled room or Oh, that. no. Uh, very few guys I run into are crazy, kinky. Most of them just either need to get laid or want some companionship. What about the inner mechanics of a studio, all the drama? Obviously, there's X amount of women there. Does the politics and the internal interplay, if you will, does it get crazy and dramatic and out of control at times? Oh, yeah. Training. It seemed good at first. When I first started, I first started at the studio um, about a month after you had started at Jay Lee's. Yeah, I but, started in July. Okay, so I started in September. But she'd been in the industry longer than me, obviously. That was my first little stint in the industry. And, and you always tell the new girls that these girls are bitches, but then the new girls get treated nice, so then they're like on the other girls' like. So like That's exactly what happened. I don't. I was told that everybody would be mean and terrible, but I get there and I'm like, everybody seems so nice. They're inviting me to their birthday parties. It's all so great. And then the drama started a couple months later, and it just turned into. It's usually crazy. one girl that starts the drama and acts a victim and has other people to point it off on, kind of like yeah. oh. Madame did to me. There was this girl we worked with, uh, Callie, who was her friend, but I didn't really associate with her because she just wasn't my type of person, you know, more into drinking, drugs, and not somebody I would have anything in common with. She decided to come in one day on one of her days off while her and I were working, and I thought somebody else, no, it was just me and you on shift. Just you and me. Yeah. And uh, she came in with her boyfriend, and they were a little intoxicated, and they took over one of the rooms, and they were in there having a party or something, I don't know what was going on. 
And then she comes out and she's waving money at my face and begging me to go have a threesome with her and her boyfriend. Like begging, telling me she'll pay me even more money than normal and that she'll pay for the room fee and everything. But she told me not to, okay? So I, I was warned. <laughs> and this was at the salon. This yeah. was at Jaylee's. And I was like, oh, well, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> I knew what could happen. <laughs> we had the threesome. We started doing that. And uh, all of a sudden, she got all weird and uh, left. And me and him were kind of sitting there going, well, what's wrong with her? Is she okay? Waiting for her to come back. We didn't know where she went. I had a client that came in at the same time you guys were in. That's when all the yeah. shit came. And when I was getting ready for my client, she was in the room with the guy, with um, Callie's boyfriend. And Callie came into the um, the girl's area and she was crying. She's like, she goes, she's doing it. She's like, she's fucking my boyfriend. And I was like, you just paid her to do it. Didn't I just warn you guys? You just paid her. She's like, why do you think she knows she do it? I'm like, oh my god. Meanwhile, we're sitting in there going, where did she go? Why is she upset? And he's like, well, what should we do? And I'm like, okay, well, I'll go check on her. And I think at that point you had left. Yeah, I went to in. go deal with my clients and put in the shower and deal with everything. Mm -hmm. I came out and found Callie in the girls' room. She decided then that she was going to start throwing things and freaking out. She went and had an argument with her boyfriend. Oh, by the way, she was entirely naked during this time. This is something, uh, give you a little bit of background information. First of all, Jaylee's is in a strip mall with other businesses around it, and there is a Chinese food restaurant that shares the parking lot with That's it that busy. is busy. And she was completely naked when this entire thing went down, and she also has, like, what is it? What are they? Fs? No, no they're triple way if boobs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're enormous fake uh, breasts. She got in a huge fight with the boyfriend. He left. She followed him out into the parking lot naked during supper time when there are a bunch of people out there. And they argued out there and drew kind of a little bit of attention. And he left, took off in his truck, and he I guess, ran her over or something like that too. Oh yeah, he ran her over, knocked her down or something. But he took off, and then she started throwing things in the studio even more. Uh, Paisley was in the back with her client, didn't know what was going on. You could hear it though. I could hear some smashing, and I was in the girls' room, like our sitting area, with Callie, and she was just chucking things at the walls, going mental. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, what are you doing? You have to stop. I tried calming her down. She freaked out. And so Callie took off down the hallway and all of a sudden I heard a rip and smash. And I came out and looked. We had all these big pictures on the walls and mirrors on the other side. And she decided it was a good idea to start ripping those gigantic pictures off the wall and smashing the glass against the opposite wall and destroying the place. She also knocked over the poinsettia. And that's when I started screaming for Paisley that, you know, I was going to be calling the police and she should probably come out and see what was going on. So she comes out wrapped in like nothing but a towel and sees all this broken glass just littering the hallway. She has to get her client out now and she had to refund him. $350? And he thought, you could see the look on his face like, what the fuck have I got myself into? <laughs> uh, and I've never been so embarrassed because he was in the shower and I was like, oh no, she's just uh, just having one of those days, you know, and then you hear, smash! with the gloss too and it looks like a whirlwind's been through there. <laughs> so uh, long story short the cops were called and she actually was not arrested brought anywhere charged with anything even though she destroyed the entire studio and went absolutely insane. He's actually from Medicine Hat Alberta which I lived in for a couple years so that was neat. I told him about my favorite place to eat Medicine Hat, a little Vietnamese place downtown where they have deep fried quail on the menu and it's literally the whole bird just plopped into the deep fryer and then they give it to you like that and it's like candy, it's so good. To be honest, I got the vibe that he's got somebody at home and wanted the little extra on the side sort of thing. They were just up north hunting for him and a bunch of his buddies, they all had their own hotel. Uh, they were hunting for elk with rifle and they got three elk and one bear and um, so now they're on their way back to Medicine Hat and like this was the stopover so I'm guessing he was just like oh he was really respectful about my rules sometimes guys get really annoyed that I have rules they think they're paying so much I should be able to do whatever they want 
but um, for the most part, the guys I've been seeing lately have been really respectful about that, so. When I worked at the massage parlor, it was a lot different. The guys were ruder, they were just awful compared to the escorting guys. It's just not as often that you come across those guys. They all seem just nicer in general. So, I mean, odds are one of these days I'm going to get one who is annoyed that I have rules, but I don't think I'll get a lot of them because it's not the norm. What's the word for a male widow? I don't know. Either way, it's been a year since he's been with a woman uh, because his wife passed away after he mentioned suffering, so I have to assume cancer or something like that. I did not feel it was my place to ask, but he was definitely very sad and lonely, you could tell. He was very nice, though. He asked me to marry him. What did you say to him when he asked you to marry him? I just laughed and gave him a hug. <laughs> I don't know what to say in that situation ever, and I've had a few marriage proposals now in this line of work, so... Did he want a lot of stuff in bed or just... No, no, he was very straightforward, very simple, didn't want a lot of time, didn't need it, just hadn't been with anybody in a long time and had only ever been with his wife in his life. His son lives in the basement who happened to come up into the kitchen as we were chatting, which was slightly awkward, but uh, didn't say anything, thankfully. <laughs> his son obviously had to have known. I would presume at that time, 12.30 a.m., he... I would assume so. I don't know, maybe his son's the one that told him to call an escort. I have no idea. Three young guys, three very good-looking young guys. Like, one of them looked like a model. He was extremely good-looking. Another one looked like a taller, less intense version of uh, Cillian Murphy. With brown eyes. And the other one was um, bleeding because <laughs> they had been out to bars and the one, the third one, had been jumped and so he had a big patch over his knee with blood coming out from under it and he had just got tattoos on his feet so his feet were all taped up and he was just in rough shape. Took a while to get the drop out of them because young attractive guys think they shouldn't have to pay regardless of the fact that they're calling an escort service or that they sh think they shouldn't have to pay a lot and it's really hard to wheel and deal with them because they're just like, no, I'm not paying that. They were just being complete dipshits about the money. They did not want to pay our prices and they kept wheeling and dealing and getting it down. And by that time we'd probably been there like two hours of trying to talk prices with these guys. And they finally paid and the minimum service prices, we had to give a half hour full service for like minimum service prices because there was nothing else and by then we were there so long it would have been stupid to not get something out of it. I wonder at times if I'm capable of maintaining long-term relationships. I think I witnessed so much violence growing up and so many relationships that were just short-run relationships. You know, my parents would have friends here and there, they would be gone, we moved around a lot, that I have not developed many long-term friendships throughout my life and I think I've rationalized myself by saying, well, There'll be other opportunities if you get in a fight with this person, if you don't really connect anymore with this person, there'll be more opportunities. But there aren't more opportunities, and the older you get, the less there are. And I suffer greatly because I don't have a core group of friends, of really people that I can talk to when I need. How did you get into the industry? I know you started stripping dancing and then how did it move into prostitution? Well, yeah, I started as a dancer. Um, that was easy enough to get into. You just, you know, call up a club and say, I want to start doing this and they say they'll train you, which they don't actually do, by the way. They say they're going to train you and then they just kind of say, wear underwear and go out there and do your thing. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? Does the owner want to have sex with you at strip clubs? No, no, no. no, no. Almost every strip club here in Edmonton is uh, Hells Angels owned it, so they're very like smoothly run and operated. And actually now, the majority of them have all been bought out by one particular Hells Angel, who is the chapter head for all of Northern Alberta. He's a pretty influential guy, so they're all run very consistently. It's nothing like that. It's not dirty or seedy. There are the clubs that are, but 
the vast majority of them are not. And then um, for me, I got out of dancing because it's a lot of work. It is so much work. You have to sell your ass for hours a day walking around a club and getting rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and that takes much more of a mental toll on me than this. Because you go up to guys and, sorry I'm not interested, go up to the next guy, sorry I'm not interested and they just completely blow you off and look at you up and down and like you're just like, oh why would I go with you and I can go with her, right? It's that attitude over and over and it's awful. And even then you go do one dance with a guy and you get what, $18? for doing that, and it's a lot of work to dance. Unless you can sell more and sell packages and get buyouts and you're really good, it's a lot of work to get to that point. So you're saying prostitution is much easier and you oh, get more money per friends. time. Oh yes, it's a world of difference. You know, like my dancer friends and my friends are very good at it. They make a lot of money for dancers, more than most. Still don't make the money I do if I have one or two calls in a night and they have to work for, you know, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. straight. He paid well for half an hour, but uh, he didn't end up finishing because he had way too much alcohol, so he was a little disappointed, more than a little disappointed by that. He was complaining that he had paid a lot for almost practically nothing, is what he said at first. I was washing up and we chatted for a bit about music and then he kind of said, well, I guess that wasn't your fault at all and blah 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 blah. Came to peace with it, I guess. Was it a, a kinky call what he wanted or he just wanted like a... No, just a very normal guy wanted to just call an escort and get laid. Anything strike you about it or it was just his an His handlebar mustache struck me. Wow, okay. He was in his hmm, maybe late 20s. <laughs> we had a Ouija board that our owner had because he didn't believe in this stuff and we played with it in the second room <laughs> and we scared the girls. Apparently we made the studio haunted after playing with the Ouija board because then a couple of the other girls got terrified that we brought ghosts into the second room the and second room door it. would open close by itself and we saw weird things in the camera. And the second room is the perfect one for that because it's this really gothic looking room. It was for domination, you know, like red and black everywhere. <laughs> they thought it was haunted and it was the funniest thing. We were just so evil. Oh, we were evil. It was kind of rushed because he wanted a massage and he wanted to shower with me and he wanted a lap dance. So we had to try and fit that like each one 10 minutes and then still have time to in between each one. It was kind of rushed in that. But Did he say why he wanted to shower? That seems like a different request. Um, lots of people want to shower with you. I don't, didn't really ask, he didn't really say why, because it's actually quite a common request. I don't end up doing it often, because I usually don't have a ponytail or there's no shower cap and I refuse to get my hair wet, so no way of drying it. What do they do when you say you won't take a shower? They just say, oh... Oh, they're usually fine with it. Um, very few people are hell-bent on showering with you, so they're usually a little disappointed, but they'll, they'll accept that. Did he like the massage? I mean, it worked well for him? Or? Yeah, it was kind of awkward also because I never carry lotion with me. It's something I should buy, like massage oil or lotion, because I get that request a lot. And they never stock lotion at hotels. So we had to use lube, which absorbs really quickly. And so when you did the lap dance, he was touching himself or what? Uh, no, no. He, ha he was covered. And he was like not even really touching me at all even though I told him he could. I mean it's not a strip club you can touch as long as you don't touch certain areas. <laughs> but no he just wanted me to dance like a stripper would. I've been doing an hour is 900 and half an hour I will offer for 600 but I don't think we would have been able to because he wanted the lap dance, he wanted the massage, he wanted to shower. Right? So he w would have had to have been an hour. No, I'm not tired. I feel dried out because I just had to wash with soap in the shower and my skin's really dry. <laughs> you saw the cops out front. Yeah, that was a little odd. They were just kind of sitting there. I didn't actually see anyone in the back, but I wasn't looking. How old was this guy? Uh, he was 23. He was young, uh, 
really kind of very, very talkative. A little weird, but in a good way. And, uh, yeah, he was in Edmonton for work. What did he want, to get laid, or he just wanted... Yeah, he wanted full service. Um, I gave him a deal for less money for less time. Sometimes when I know they're not going to be able to take out, I'll do that just to get more money. Anything strike you about that call that was interesting, out of the ordinary? The hotel room doesn't have a thermostat, so you couldn't turn the heat up, and it was freezing. Wow. <laughs> I thought that was very odd. When you say weird, why? What? Very, very talkative. And he would talk to himself in front of me, as in, like, kind of... I think he was nervous, and so he was just kind of rambling. It okay. Was funny. Was he it? What did he look like? Uh, he was actually, like, all, well, he wasn't, you know, mm, he wasn't, he was better looking than average, but he wasn't what you would consider to be a really good looking person. Like, he had a baby face, um, and a cute face, but his body was, you know, not toned up or anything. What you do when the client comes in is you put them in a room and each girl meets them separately, like individually, and they just look you up and down and they're comparing you to the other girl or other two girls that they've just seen. And some clients are not like that, but a lot of them had this look in their face like, ooh, I'm going to pick her, not you. It wasn't as bad as dancing, I'll say that much, but it did mentally take a toll. They're looking at you and they're looking at your body and they're not seeing anything other than body shape, what you look like, what they think they can do with you. And they can't all be the most attractive guys in the world, which for me would add another layer of to and it. Massage that's definitely thing. not. That and dancing too, it was, and I did say this to a few guys, it's like, really? You're going to look at me like that? You're going to treat me like that? You know, in public, I wouldn't give you the time of day, let alone, you know, sleep with you, and you're going to look at me like I'm a piece of me? To be honest, I don't have a, like a checklist. I don't go in and look around. I'm not looking for that. I kind of just meet the guy, shake his hand, introduce myself, and then I go sit down somewhere and talk for a little bit. I don't even ask for the drop up front. Usually I talk a little bit, a couple minutes first, and then ask for the drop, get a feel of what the guy's like. Uh, if there's something odd with places like drugs or anything it's going to stand out so I just kind of never noticed a weapon but <laughs> that's something you get a lot just people trying to work a deal huh? yes yeah. and they'll it's always well this girl did it for this it's like okay well I'm here now you've paid the drop call that girl then pay her another drop to see what you get but yeah they always think they can get one so is negotiating is a skill you acquire as you go it sounds like to me it sounds like it would be you know, it's something like getting your chops. You, you learn how to do it and what to say or how to maneuver a little bit. I guess so. I, I have gotten better. I've gotten less rigid. I'm much more willing to negotiate now, whereas when I first started, it was more like, no, this is my price for this, this is my price for this. And I wouldn't, like, meet in the middle. But now I'm a lot more willing to, so... Those message boards, they're basically throughout Canada. I think they have them in the States too, where um, guys that go to Robin Tags or have escort services will go online, and it's actually legal. I don't know how they get away with this. They'll rate the girl, talk about the services they did, and what they try to get away with, and how they try to bargain the girl down her prices. Or, um, because how it works, if they give the girl a good review, the girl can actually um, get more clientele from it. But what the girls don't figure out is, really, is that the kind of clientele you want? Someone that treats you like a piece of trash and puts everything on display of what you've done and, and how you've done it. So these guys come in here thinking that it's power of the girls, that um, they can look at us like that and basically treat us like a piece of meat and try to get us to do things we don't want to do or they're going to give us a bad review. I think a lot of people here who use escorts understand the difference between escorting and, you know, a girl walking on the street. Can you define that quickly, what that difference in your opinion is? Well, uh, street walking is illegal, so the difference is I have a license, I take care of myself, I'm not addicted to drugs, you know, I go in there, I'm professional, I'm working, I won't drink with a client. 
won't do drugs with a client, I won't give out my phone number to any clients. Streetwalking girls are more prone to getting murdered <laughs> or going to jail. Do you like I raw think... sex? Like. I don't, in my personal life, I don't like to have sex for the sake of having sex. I think for me it's more intimate because there's things obviously I'll do with my boyfriend that I want to do with clients. So for my client, anyone can have sex or, you know, fuck. Um, but when you're with someone you love or care about, it's a total different ball game, right? There's the intimacy and then wanting to be with them and then the sex is just that much more special. It's not just fucking. I mean, sometimes you can get it where you're just like going at it because you're just horny as hell and you make it fun, but... For me, it's the intimacy of being with that one person. What about you, Sarah? Usually, if I have somebody in my personal life who I'm attracted to, I want to fuck them. <laughs> it's not just it's not just intimacy. I mean, there is that too, but I find that regardless of the fact that I'm in this industry, I still have the same sex drive and same desires with my personal sex life as I did before getting in the industry. It hasn't changed. I think I have a little bit different view because I've been in it longer, so... Yeah. I do get, like, sometimes you just want to be intimate, but before I got in the industry, I just wanted to be intimate sometimes, too. Sometimes you just want to have a quickie. That was a double call, correct? Uh, yeah, I met, um, Alexis. I was worried it wasn't going to work out. I was almost positive because it was two guys, and they were native guys. And native guys are usually much more tight-fisted. Okay, but it did, so they finally, you guys brokered a deal or whatever. Yeah, it worked out. They ended up paying for half an hour. Also, because the one guy was paying for both, and he also covered the drops, he was seeing the money fly out a lot more, so he wasn't too happy. But they were both happy when we were leaving, so... Okay, <laughs> what about worked. Alexis? Hers must have went well. Um, they had, like, a suite at the top of the hotel, so they actually had two separate bedrooms that we went into. So, I didn't see her at all during her call, but she got the same amount of money for the same amount of time. Were they expensive rooms or room, the whole thing, do you think? I'm not sure. I don't see this hotel as a high-class hotel. Never really have. The room was nicer, I will admit. It was nicer than I thought it would be going into there, but that's probably also because it was considered a suite. In Edmonton, the uh, vice officers here seem to have a real problem with uh, escort agencies and studios that are run by men, with male owners. They do not like it, then they get shut down very quickly. In fact, Jaylee's is one of the only ones that hasn't been. Yeah, although the way it's going, who knows? It'll get there. Why do you think they have an issue with men? They think men are going to take advantage of the escorts or what, the prostitutes? Okay. Yeah. It usually happens like that. Like, for the most part, every male owner that's owned escort or massage ends up sleeping with the girls. And it causes drama with the girls, and it causes drama with Vice and with the studio. Um, it's basically like they have, well, basically it is their own private little whorehouse, and then when things don't go the way, they just get rid of the girls. It's not the way to run a business. It's not professional. And But unfortunately, when you're, you're as a girl, in a studio with other bunch of girls and there's only one guy, uh, you know, and say you don't have anyone in your personal life, it's hard not to get involved in that situation, especially if the guy's good at manipulating you in certain situations, right? One of the owners, um, as a joke, when the new girl starts, is um, he'll come in and he'll try the girls out. He's the owner? One of the owners. And so, define try him out. He'll say, I need you to audition, so... No, 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 no. 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 The girls uh, don't even know he's an owner because he's hardly ever there. So, like, say she's just started, she'll go into the room, he'll, uh, he'll greet the girls all at once, like, like a regular client, and then he'll be like, okay, I want you, go into a room, and then he'll pay her and then try her out like a client, but he won't tell that he's actually an owner. So it's similar to that TV show, Undercover Boss. Very similar, <laughs> very similar, yeah. I guess that's because the way to put it. There are two owners of Jaylee's, they both own half. And this is the one that does, isn't there all the time. The other owner, he does all of the books and everything. He's there. He interviews the girls. This one will come in when he knows a new girl's been hired. He'll tell the other girls that know him not to tell her. And then he will actually pay her for services and, you know, try her out. He is a nice guy, though. I do like him more. He's a nice guy. Just really cool. Yeah, that's kind of creepy when he does that, but... Is it weird watching her be sexual with a guy or you're used to it or 
Um, I'm used to it. It's not weird, I think, in the conventional sense. It's annoying in a way, though, because she puts on a much different act than I do. She's much different, so it's really hard to get to in a flow with her. Like, I'm not very vocal, and she's very vocal, so it's kind of like I always feel like a little left out of that and not quite sure what to do. Do you think she enjoys the vocality of it? No. It's all an act. I, I've known her for a while. And it's, does it turn the guys on, or you don't know if it does? It seems to? Or oh, yeah, not? it seems to. It's just, for me, I come in with a very different personality than her. She's very hard and rigid, and then she'll be very vocal and very into that. Whereas I come in and I try to be, like, bubbly and happy and easygoing, and so I'm a lot more quiet and submissive, where she's very dominant. So we just don't really mesh well as a duo like that. But I'm sure if we did it more often, we'd figure out a way. Do you think both of you prostitution has opened either of you up sexually? I think it has for me. I've learned a lot of things. It kind of, it fixed me negatively and sometimes in a relationship because I want to do all these crazy things. But I've learned <laughs> to keep myself like occupied and entertained. And then the guy just wants to lie there like a dead fish. And you're know, like, get up, let's do the, <laughs> get to the domination, make them do it. I'm much the opposite of that. It's actually done the opposite on me. I was always like, oh, I want to experiment and try all these different things, and I want to have a partner that's going to be in an open relationship with me, and a swinger, and do this and that. And now that I've gotten in this industry, I'm like, I just, just want somebody. I don't care if they're a swinger. I don't care about their fetishes. I got enough weird shit at work, I just want someone normal. <laughs> so you don't want to go to an orgy if there was a safe one, I, swingers convention? As a single person, I would. As a single person, but I've always been that kind of person. I actually have less sex now, though, as a prostitute than I did when I was not, when I was working, like, normal jobs. What attracts you to, like, an orgy of swingers conventions? I don't know. You have sex with a bunch of people at once. What's... Wouldn't everybody be attracted to that? See, about? I'm like the opposite of that with my personal life before even I got into this. In my personal life, I'm not into, like, I'll have one person, I'm happy with one person, that's it. Um, it's just I like doing the things that I've learned at work, like the positions and that that I'm creative with. I didn't, I wasn't as open-minded as she was, which is kind of funny because we had this conversation when we worked at the studio, how she was open and, and like, the kind of stuff and how it's kind of, like, changed now. Mm-hmm. But it's different, too, because a guy, obviously, after he orgasms, he has to take a break. But if you went to an orgy, you could be with five guys in a row, or does that get tiring, too? Or can you have sex over and over and enjoy it? Well, you don't have to orgasm. That's the thing. Guys, I guess they're always building up to that for sex. For me, I'm not. If I was to go to an orgy, I wouldn't orgasm. I, I wouldn't want to. Would you want to fuck five guys? Well, yeah, sure, if they were hot. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to orgasm because the minute that happens, you you lose interest. You're like, well, this is boring now. Let's so if you didn't have an orgasm screwing these five guys, it feels good every time. So that's where you would want to keep doing it because it feels good. The feeling is good yeah. even though you don't come. For a guy, it feels good, but it feels so great you want to have an orgasm. See, that's the case too for me, obviously. That's the case for any human being, but I know myself well enough to know that once that orgasm happens, I am not interested, I'm turned off, I don't want to, and it's just done. I'm done. Right? And I can get turned on again, but for me what would happen is I would immediately lose interest and go home. So I wouldn't want to. I'd want to push that off so that I could continue to enjoy my time. I believe after death that you become nothing. There's nothing. Uh, that's my viewpoint. I don't believe there's a heaven. I don't believe there's a hell. I don't believe our spirit flies out into something else. I don't believe in reincarnation. So is there a point at all to life? I think life is a random series of events. Well, do you think there's a point to it at all? No. Um, I think you can create your own point to life if you decide that you want to accomplish something or leave a mark, but I believe in nothing. Well, if there's no point, why do you keep living? Because you have the instinct of the homo sapien oh, to stay alive? Yes, that instinct is so unbelievably powerful, it's amazing. You know, there's nothing more powerful than your instinct to stay alive. So no matter how much you don't believe in that, you have to be in a seriously 
bad state of mind. Or mentally ill, right. Yeah, exactly. to be able to circumvent and go past that instinct because it's, it's unbelievably powerful. Paisley, do you share Sarah's views? No, I'm not particularly religious. I mean, I've dabbled in a bit of everything. I do believe in uh, reincarnation and I do believe in, in of life now just because I grew up with a lot of, in South Africa, you know, there's a lot of witchcraft and there's a lot of experiences in that that I've had with spirits and all that kind of things. So I believe there's something there, but I don't, I don't necessarily believe there's a heaven and hell the way that the Bible says there is. I believe that hell would be your own personal hell depending on um, what you're afraid of in life or what you personally would feel like. So if you're worried about dying lonely, you'd be stuck here and you'd be lonely or something to that extent. And as far as heaven goes, I think it's, you're not going to a place where it's heaven, it's you just finding peace. Always sending nice messages. And then he just told me yesterday that he's, uh, He's dying. And the. F just. It, he was nice enough, you know, the whole time he's known uh, that he's been dying to, like, reach out to me and always tell me to. <laughs> have, like, a good day and stuff. Just the fact that he would take his time. Shows you truly amazing people. For sure enough, there are the girls who are addicted to drugs. There are the girls who drink, who offer you know dirty services, unsafe services, for different amounts of money. There are the girls that have the childhood abuse and problems and get into it for the wrong reasons. But there are plenty of girls who just get into it because they can. And I know there's that perception that prostitution is never a choice, nobody would make the choice to be a prostitute, nobody would willingly choose to get into this, it's always she got into this because of A, B, C, or D. But I'm a walking example of somebody who just made the choice. I went out and said, I want to do this, and started doing it. And there are more girls out there than you realize who have made that choice. I feel like if that information was out there and somebody was out there challenging that perception, a lot of people would realize it's not all like that and there's nothing wrong with what we do. We are not hurting anybody. We are not hurting ourselves unless we're offering those dirty services. I don't understand why we can't be protected the same way a normal girl who just happens to go have sex with random people is. Just the straight escorting part. I enjoy the socialization with people because I am a people's person. Uh, I like talking to people and, and learning things and you meet p great people with great different cultures and experiences and that. That I enjoy, but the part, you know, any sexual part of it, I don't. It's just acting. For me, it's not something I can really get into because for me, if you're going to be intimate, intimacy is something between a girlfriend and boyfriend, right? This is just a business transaction. For me, through experience, women seem to be more comfortable with pooping and talking about it than men. Do you guys have an opinion? And it may be because I've asked people before that women have babies and stuff, so they're used to wiping yeah. it up. But I'm, I, men hardly ever talk about it. And personally, I'm grossed out by it. I don't like to talk about it. But every woman I've ever met talks about pooping and... It, I'm okay with it because I have a baby, so I'm fine with dealing with the poop and that. Like I said earlier, if I were in the position where I had to take care of someone and wipe their bum and that, I'd do it. And I've had clients that have come in and pooped in diapers and stuff too, so I've had to deal with that and I'm used to it. But I think before I had my daughter and before this industry, it wouldn't be something I'd be comfortable with because it's dirty to touch people's feces. What about even talking about it, Sarah? Are you comfortable? Because guys don't even like to talk about it, but women do, I find. It's something for me that I have forcibly gotten more comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with it, especially not to men. My girlfriends is one thing, and I never talk about my own poop, unless it's just like, I have to poop, and that's what I'll say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my girlfriends, like Paisley and my other girlfriend Larissa, 
talk about their poop all the time, and it's and, or poop in general, and it's like. Well, it's how? I mean, like, they, do you talk about the consistency? Oh, or what do girls talk about? They're just oh. like, oh, I have to poop, or oh. oh, it's been a while since I pooped. That felt really good. I'm glad I got to poop, or something like that. Uh, and so for me, I've gotten more comfortable in even just saying like I have to poop because they are. So it's made me because even a year ago, I'd never say that. I'd be like, I have to pee. Do either of you guys drink? You mentioned drugs and alcohol. I don't drink at all. I, my stomach can't process alcohol, so since I try to take a drink, I get really sick. So you guys are completely the antithesis to the stigma associated with you know prostitutes. You guys don't drink. You don't do drugs. You're... Women seem to be more comfortable with pooping and talking about it than men. Do you guys have an opinion? And it may be because I've asked people before that women have babies and stuff, so they're used to wiping yeah. it up. But I'm, I, men hardly ever talk about it. And personally, I'm grossed out by it. I don't like to talk about it. But every woman I've ever met talks about pooping and. It, I'm okay with it because I have a baby, so I'm fine with dealing with the poop in that. Like I said earlier, if I were in the position where I had to take care of someone and wipe their bum in that, I'd do it. And I've had clients that have come in and pooped in diapers and stuff too, so I've had to deal with that and I'm used to it. But I think before I had my daughter and before this industry, it wouldn't be something I'd be comfortable with because it's dirty to touch people's feces. What about even talking about it, Sarah? Are you comfortable? Because guys don't even like to talk about it, but women do, I find. It's something for me that I have forcibly gotten more comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with it, especially not to men. My girlfriends is one thing, and I never talk about my own poop, unless it's just like, I have to poop, and that's what I'll say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my girlfriends, like Paisley and my other girlfriend Larissa, talk about their poop all the time, and it's and, or poop in general, and it's like... You well, know, how? I mean, like, they, do you talk about the consistency? Oh, or what God. do girls talk about? They're just oh. like, oh, I have to poop, or oh. oh, it's been a while since I pooped, that felt really good, I'm glad I got to poop, or something like that. Uh, and so for me, I've gotten more comfortable in even just saying, like, I have to poop, because they are. So it's made me, because even a year ago, I'd never say that, I'd be like, I have to pee. Sure. No, about no drinking the drugs. stigma with prostitutes too, it's something that uh, here in Canada it is legal. Each municipality can put its own bylaws on prostitution, in, like the city of Edmonton, where you have to have an Edmonton uh, license to be a prostitute. However, because Canada is so close to America, and in America it is so illegal, and that's where you know pop culture and the media here comes from, most people here do not realize it's legal. It's all that trickle over from America and they think it's the exact same here as it is there. People just aren't educated. Why do you think prostitutes get murdered? They're easy targets or do you have an opinion as to why? Sometimes girls that are with agencies get sent into bad calls because the girl answering the phone doesn't screen the call properly, right? Or you go there and my experience, I was in this, where you get told there's one person and it ends up being two and you can't fight them off. Um, some guys just don't have respect for a woman. They just think that, that the women in this industry are less than human and that it's okay, nobody's going to miss us. What did you want to be growing up? I changed what I wanted to be growing up about every three months. Uh, I mean, for the longest time I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I wanted to play hockey for the Edmonton Oilers when I was about three years old. That was my goal. I've always thought psychology and psychiatry would be really interesting to get into. Uh, zoology, marine biology, anything biology related really would be very interesting for me. What about you, Paisley? Growing up, what did you want to be? Um, I've always wanted to be a lawyer, which I did do some schooling for, and I wanted to do something in my art, like with comic book art or animation, which I do freelance, but I just haven't had the, um, the time or the money to really pursue it. Guys would be prostitutes growing up. You'd think it's the greatest thing in the world. You can have sex and get paid for it. But for girls, see, it's a different, it's a gender thing. You think differently about a woman than you do a guy. A guy's like a gigolo. And I think gigolo, they make it more lighthearted, especially when you watch on TV. It doesn't seem like a bad thing. Because guys are whores anyway, so mm -hmm. it kind of seems like a natural progression. But it's a lot harder for a guy to be a gigolo, whereas a girl can get a lot more guys sexually. Yeah. Well, it depends if you're looking for the female market or you swing both ways. So my handcuffs. This is only just some of the stuff I have, not everything. Uh, one of my uh, gags, full gag. 
my pussy paddle. This uh, is, it used to be a crop, but now because it, it broke, it's a cane. It's good for CBT when you hit them on the walls. And I think my crop's in my car. This little device, you put it on, it's like a ball gag, and then you can attach different things to it. So this has got the leash attached to it. You can attach the toilet brush so they can clean your toilet. Um, there's some other things here too. There's a little bowl I used to have so they can serve you and you can sit there and eat. One of my little, uh, whoops. This is more for like tickling and stuff. It hurts a little bit when you hit people, but not so much. This one hurts when you hit them. My cat on my tail. This one's fun. And you can tie them up and strangle them with that too. My pinwheel. I love the pinwheel. This one's uh, busted from when um, Kelly chucked it, but it still works pretty well, especially on some certain sensitive areas. Protection. Everything's always covered when it comes to uh, toys. Uh, this is one of the strap ons I have. So this is the one usually you'll round them from the back and then I have another one that attaches. That's the one that I'll make them give head to while I'm rounding them from the back. Like that. <laughs> uh, blindfolds. And then these also can turn into ties uh, where I tie them to the door. I have tie restraints. A collar. restraints you can use for the ankles or for the wrists. Just another little thing that attaches to that mouthpiece for cleaning. A smaller version of one of my little whoops. Box cutter. That's uh, for a couple things. Uh, blindfold. And then I have masks for them to wear for a sensory deprivation. And I have another one here and then I have one of these and the name escapes me right now what it is but basically it's a spray bar that's what it is. So you can hold it like that or against your legs so they can't move or you can even suspend them. And that's what's in this goodie bag. Lots of fun. BDSM kitty. <laughs>